So You Can Play That Game is proudly sponsored by NiceGameShop.com, the place to go for rare and unusual Asian games. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the next thing on the agenda with these five wonderful people uh, is the tabletop media panel. So this is an opportunity to ask these people their thoughts on uh, running their channels, uh, what kind of materials you can provide them as designers or publishers or uh, whoever else you might be in the industry, or you know, how your services might be, be interesting to people like the tabletop generation people over there, or dice, or whoever else. Um, yeah, so have John from Actual LOL, this is a show, YouTube oh. review personality, also yeah, known as Timmy. Face, but... <laughs> uh, yeah. have... Sorry, I'm John, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have Rory, who's been writing for Zatsu Games, also runs board meeting, board meeting, board meeting, board meeting, board meeting, board meeting. Board meeting. Uh, Then we have Michael, who runs Two Can Play That Game. And we have Lindsay, Shiny Happy Meeples, and Mike of Who Dares Rolls. So, completely family open. And um, at this point, we just want each of you, probably starting with John, moving on to Mike, explain what your channel is, what it is you do, what it is that you find you know difficult about running your, your channel, what kind of challenges you come up against in doing it, and what kind of things you know you, you would think would be interesting or, or helpful from publishers or designers, um, you know, when you might be reviewing the game, uh, you know, if you're doing Kickstarter previews, I know some people do. Uh, what kind of things a Kickstarter creator might be able to, to provide for you to make that, uh, you know, that whole experience easier and um, efficient and you know, get the best value from it. So, okay. uh, Yeah, so I'm John and I, uh, I've been doing actual old videos for a couple of years now and uh, I mostly focus on, uh, well I do comedy characters so I dress up in wigs and do silly voices where the characters are playing the game around a table but I also do reviews and top tens and uh, vlogs and things like that, and um, I need to say uh, other stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> in terms of uh, working with uh, publishers, um, I've certainly been in contact with a bunch of different publishers, and uh, I mean, I think it'd be best to kind of talk it all through together. But um, I, I find that I get contacted by a lot of smaller publishers, and uh, it can be a real mixed bag. And um, I think uh, a terrible idea is to just send a blanket email to uh, all of the YouTubers that you've heard of without even using their name in the title. Because um, you only have to watch one of my videos to learn my name. Uh, and, uh, and, but I also think it's really important to, to cater to specific YouTubers. I tend to cover more um, like lighter games, social games, family games. Um, I tend not to do like Euro games or heavy strategy games and so if you're contacting me about a Kickstarter about this game that I personally have no interest in and watching a couple of my videos would tell you that then um, I'm sort of immediately turning off from your email just because like you've taken no, you've made no effort in contacting me and you generally like um, publishers are contacting because they want a favour in return uh, so I think there's that level, uh, perhaps you could you guys could add on from that. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you don't really do much in the way of Kickstarter previews mm. or anything like that anyway, do you? So, for, for you, you tend to focus on published yeah. games. But if, like any of the publishers and designers here, for example, had a published game, how would you want them to go about contacting you about it if they wanted to I, yeah. see if you'd be willing to cover it? I think, I, it's <laughs> funny, <laughs> um, I saw Jamie Stegmaier talking about it the other day, and he was saying, like, a, his top tip was to kind of reach out before you, because effectively, when you've got a game, you're asking for something. Uh, and, and, and he was saying, reach out before you do that. Kind of try and create a dialogue first. Um, and that might not always work, because I guess emails can be ignored. But I think there is a sense of trying to treat them like a person and trying not immediately to just go straight to what, what do you want from them. Um, but yeah, if, if someone's to contact me, I think they need to be trying to explain why I might be interested in it in terms of uh, my channel or maybe the taste that I, you know, so it might be like, oh, I saw you reviewed this game and you liked it and we think that, you know, our game is like this in, in uh, something like that. Um, and, uh, but also, it, I think it is worth understanding that not all channels do Kickstarter games um, and so it may be more that you um, start to create a dialogue and give them a copy after the Kickstarter has been published, you know, after it's successful, things like that. Um, because, uh, yeah, but it, it's just, 
you had you had to if you were to see it from our perspective, um, I, I don't make any money from my channel currently, and so I'm doing it as a hobby, and I'm also trying to build up my channel. And so I, I have to, every video that I make takes quite a lot of time, so I have to decide why am I covering this game or why am I covering this category of games. And so I tend to, you know, sometimes I'm looking at it just because I like it or enjoy it and I want to share it with the world, that, that's why I kind of started it. And then other times you might be a bit more um, tactical about it and you're picking certain categories or certain games because you think people are going to watch that video because ultimately you want to grow your audience. If nobody's watching it, it uh, doesn't feel as um, worthwhile doing. So I would tend to, to cover games I think people are going to want to watch about. Um, and so that is something you have to bear in mind when you're approaching uh, reviewers that um, they don't just immediately want to review your game. And, and so the, the, there's that. It's a, a tricky relationship, I find, to kind of. I don't know if you could add on that. Uh, well, we'll go to Rory, because you do written reviews. So you I do, yeah. kind of say the difference there. Are you doing written news? Yeah, so um, I'm Rory. Um, so I've, uh, I'm only kind of new. I'm the, like the small local fish in this pond of the media people here. I've only been doing it for a few months. Um, I'm solely written reviews, as Mark said. Um, I. Uh, second. What should I say? Board meetings. Board meetings, yeah. Um, so uh, I find this with my problem. I, I'm at a point where I'm only really reviewing games that I'm physically going out and buying. Um, so a lot of that at the moment is um, they're probably going to be games that I already like, so they're probably already going to be uh, you know, games that are going to get positive reviews because I already like them. I'm at the moment I'm still just trying to build up my contacts to reach out to more people to get a broader scope. Yes. Um, some people have started contacting me about Kickstarter, um, Kickstarter previews, which I'm very very happy to do, and I'm at a point where I'm going to have to take on anything to improve my exposure. My primary focus at the moment is probably on the much shorter games. Uh, one of the things I'm on social media about a lot is um, my lunch break games, which are games that you can normally play within an hour, hour and a half tops um, on the lighter spectrum of the game. That's kind of what I do. I don't really have any problems per se at the moment because I'm still quite new. That's why I'm here today to kind of network and meet some of you and hopefully learn from these guys that have been doing for a little bit longer. That's kind of me. If I could just add to that briefly, um, talking about being a smaller uh, uh, reviewer, when like when when I started out, um, you really take notice of the companies that reach out to you early on. Like you know, if I if I just made one or two videos and uh, you know nobody really cares about you, and rightly so. Uh, but I got contacted by a few publishers then who were very sort of passionate about this type of content I was making. They were they were sort of. Um, they were saying nice things about the way I was making it, how it's different to what was already out there. And that has really stuck with me. And so now I have these relationships with those publishers because they made the effort when I was smaller to kind of champion me in, in, in the way that other people weren't doing. And so I think it's really important to reach out to people like Rory like um, at the start. If you see something in them that you think, oh, okay, if, if I, I really like the stuff that Rory's doing, and if he keeps doing this for you know however long, I think he's going to be really big. You want to get in there on the ground floor um, because when he when he gets a bit bigger, um, then he, he can really kind of uh, like there's that relationship already built, and that, that's just something I noticed. So yeah. carry on. That's that. Remember we were just talking about the board and dice, right? Uh, the Polish press, obviously. I met them at the UK Games Expo. There's been a lot of discourse, especially over social media. So I, I naturally am more favourable to those guys because they've been kind of, they're tagging me and pretty much everything they put on there. So if you follow Board Dice on Twitter, chances are my name's attached to everything that they post, which, <laughs> which is great. Uh, it gets my name out there, might get your curiosity up, and that's going back and forth. So I'm always going to be more favourable. So it builds that relationship and it's a great relationship to start. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I, think, uh, I think one thing to be clear with, using the term favourable isn't saying I'm yeah. going to give you a good yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. It's saying you're more willing to spend the time on the game, yeah. mm. to take on the game, say, yes, send me the game and I'll happily do a review, rather than go, okay, well, I haven't really heard of you before. Yeah. Um, I'm busy. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and just carry on from that with the, uh, it's, I mean, it's tricky to know what you could maybe offer that person, but what I found from the couple of publishers that I was kind of referring to was that 
they were willing to share my content when I wasn't covering their game. You know, that they were willing to, I was reviewing a completely different game, but they were, they were trying to be part of the community and they were sharing it. And so I, you know, I took that, on, I, I, I took part from that and, and so it became a mutually beneficial relationship. But again, yeah, I would never give them a positive review, it's just so I'd be much more likely to play their game or cover their game. Yeah, yeah. move to the top of the stack, doesn't it? Right, exactly. Um, so, I'm Michael from Team Player Game. I do rules videos, playthroughs, reviews, pretty much everything under the sun. Um, and I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I think what it all comes down to in regards to you guys contacting us to get the content and us contacting you potentially to get games, it's all about that relationship. You don't want some reviewer with no following that you've never heard from going, please give me a free game same way for a reviewer, you don't want a publisher who's never made another game contacting you going, review my game, say nice things about my game, out of the blue, and not saying that. It's all about building up that relationship. And that all comes, as John was saying, it comes from working together to mutually build each other's brands, interacting, as Rory said about board and dice, I've had the same experience with people. They are interacting, they're sharing your content, they're commenting on your content. They're being interactive to you and you do the same back to them. You say, oh yeah, I really like the look of your game, I'm really excited about it, even when you're not actually even producing a review. Because all of us have content, even without it being the reviews, being, you know, blogs, whatever, because we're all on social media. And it's the word of mouth about social media. If you see, you know, the Tom Bassels in the world going, I'm really excited for Twilight Fury 4 or whatever, everyone else is suddenly excited. And it's the same way just on a smaller scale. And so that's what it all comes down to. It all comes down to just working together, not pitching at each other, not saying, yeah, yeah, can I have this, can I have that? Just interacting and it'll happen naturally. Hello, I'm Lindsay. Um, I run a channel and blog and Instagram all under Shiny Happy Meatballs. So, Shiny Happy Meatballs. So, everyone should have the REM song. Um, so, yeah, I, I started off actually, I was just blogging on like Tumblr a few years ago, and then I decided that I wanted to start, because I was just like photographing my plates and things like that. And then I moved it over onto WordPress, where I thought I could actually start writing some reviews of the games I was playing. So it kind of stemmed from there. And actually it was Instagram that got me kind of more connected with other board gamers, because there's actually a really good board game community on Instagram. And um, then I started to do YouTube videos as well. So basically, through my Instagram page um, initially, I started linking up everything I was doing. So now, if you see one of my reviews or solo plays or previews, then it's linked up to my Instagram by a picture that kind of relates to what I'm doing and then you can go on my blog and read about it. But what I try and make sure I do is on every different platform I put something a little bit different on there because if I'm posting the same content <coughs> over like every channel then no one's going to look on a specific one maybe, so I just make sure that I put something a little bit different on each page. And so Instagram, I kind of um, learned a lot about that when I had my own uh, fashion business. So yeah, I've learned quite a few interesting things when I was talking about Instagram, then I'll be able to share information. Um, as for me, I think that um, I would really just agree with what the guys here have said so far. Um, and the only thing I think really is that um, sometimes a reviewer isn't going to just like your game because you've agreed to do it. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I've had some people come back to me not very happy with me because I wasn't, I was never negative, I'd never be negative or particularly mean or anything about a game, but I'd have to be honest, there's something that I'm not quite feeling and um, that I've never said, like, you know, no one else, everyone else should agree with me, I've said in my opinion. But people have not been very happy with me because I haven't given it a 100% flattering glowing review. So I think it's important just to realise that, you know, just because you ask someone to do it doesn't mean you're going to, like, you know. <laughs> I think it's like, do you know what I mean? Like, you've got to be honest again today. Um, yeah. And anyone got any questions for me afterwards? That's fine. <laughs>
in terms of, in terms of bad reviews, do you ever sort of feel like you can go the sort of Rado route, which is he only reviews stuff that he likes? He, otherwise, he just won't do it. He'll say, I've played it once, I'm not going to put the time investment in. Or are you guys sort of fine with doing the bad reviews sometimes because you have both sides of the coin? Firstly, let's get terminology right. Because there's no such thing as a bad review, necessarily. Wow. Negative, I would allow. But a bad review is simply a review that doesn't accurately portray your game or your opinions about it. Most reviewers, and I'm not going to say all reviewers that way, do not do bad reviews. There are reviews who do negative reviews. Mike loves doing them. Um, what did the get? Yep. And quite a few of us do. But at the end of the day, doing a negative review isn't a nice experience. No one enjoys it often, Mike. And so it, it, you are less willing to spend the time because reviews do take time. And so you don't want to sit there for hours saying bad things about the game. There's also the aspect of if you play a game and you don't enjoy it, to be able to do a fair review, you can't just have played the game once, but you didn't enjoy it, you don't want to play it again. So that's another kind of key reason why you're not going to get many negative reviews out there. Yeah. I personally, if I set out to do a review, I will play, play, play. And sometimes I found I hated my first play and end up actually really loving the game. Um, Five Tribes was an example of that for me. I hated my first play of Five Tribes. But then I kind of left it a few weeks and was like, I want to play that again and do better. And I did, and I enjoyed it more and more. And every time I've played it since, I enjoy it more. So there's definitely an argument for doing that if you can. But most reviewers have not the time to do that for all games. I've had an instance. Um, a little while ago where I was asked to do a review for a game and I really didn't like it, I didn't think the game was complete um, and rather than publicise that, it was a phone call with that designer explaining why I just I wasn't going to <coughs> do that review. I didn't think it was complete, I didn't think it was particularly fair to slander them, uh, not slander, but I didn't think it was particularly fair to, for me to write that, I didn't feel there was much redeeming qualities to the game that I could talk in favour about. I have done a few negative reviews, I mean, I'm only doing published games, there are games that I do not like. Um, Steampunk Rally, isn't a game? I do not like that game. Yeah. I, 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 you might like it, but we can have that and that's a discussion and I try and put my opinions across that. I don't like it for this reason. But there are that's other the games thing, that as are... As long as you can give reasons, yeah. mm -hmm. it is still useful. Because I can say that I absolutely hate a game and it can still be incredibly useful and cause people to go out and buy that game because they'll go, but hang on, I like what you hate. <laughs> but, um, I, uh, there's something that I think about um, in, with publishers is, um, and this is, c could be tricky for smaller publishers, is, is how you send the game to the reviewer, um, if that's something that you're doing. Um, you know, most people would assume that if you're sending them a free game that you want a review in return. And, and that is pretty much the kind of uh, unwritten contract that most reviewers have and that I have had with almost every publisher. Um, but I think sometimes that can work against both the publisher and the reviewer because, uh, because the reviewer might end up reviewing a game that they don't like or that, like Michael was saying, you have to sort of trawl through it and you put it out there and the, the video doesn't really help the publisher and it doesn't help the reviewer. Um, Whereas what you can do, uh, and, and I've seen a few times, um, but it's potentially more costly, is to, is to send a game to a reviewer and just sort of say, look, I'd, I'd love for you to play my game um, and do, almost do what you will with it. And then if the person really loves it, they're probably going to cover it. Um, and they may still review it because they, they don't, you know, they, they need to review games for their channel. But if they really don't like it, or if for whatever reason they just don't think it's the right fit for their channel, because like personally, if I was sent a game that I, I didn't necessarily feel like um, I had the understanding of that genre, perhaps I might be like, well, this isn't the right fit for me. And then that uh, allows it, because I, I think it's tricky. You can't. I would never say that. I, I have done negative reviews, and uh, you know, ethically as a reviewer, um, I believe that I should give an honest opinion about a game, but if I play a game once and hate it, I haven't played it enough to give it a proper review, but I also don't want to play it again and I could just spend my time better doing something else, and I think that's potentially a, a good situation sometimes. 
Um, I, th I think what it comes down to is being clear ahead of time. If you're going to contact a review for the game, for a review or whatever, being clear with what your expectations are and what their expectations are. Most reviewers, if you said up front, I'm going to send you this game, I want you to play it. If you don't like it, just let me know, I'll pay for you to send it back to me or on to another reviewer. They'd go, fine. There's plenty of reviewers, if you send them a game and say, look, I don't have many copies of this or whatever, can you just play it and then do the review if you want to do a review, if not, send it on type thing. It's not going to be a problem. I mean, Lindsay's part of um, all game exposure collective that started up, where it is literally a group of reviewers. You don't even have to pay for them to send the games off. They send the games yeah. off around a group of reviewers. So there is very much a mentality amongst the review community to do that. You just need to be upfront ahead of time with what you're expecting. I think that's the thing, like, just to have really clear communication between um, who you're sending the games to and to the reviewers, because at the end of the day, like, um, yeah, you've got to sort of make sure that you both are on the same page. So I've had people contact me, it was really casual, oh yeah, review this, whatever you want. And I was like, okay, cool. And then within the two days, they're like, have you played it? Have you played it? And he's like, whoa, okay. Um, because I think people don't realise things do take a lot of time. Um, if you want to produce anything decent, you've got to take the time to do a good piece of writing, put a good video together, do a good edit. Um, and if you're doing it around like uh, full-time work, part-time work, or raising children, um, then you know your time is limited. So, but if someone said to me ahead of time, "I need a review by this date," then I would, and that's what we do with BG is we we have a list of the games we've got and who they're with, and we prioritise um, certain games because of when Kickstarter's coming out, or you know. So yeah, communication. Yeah. And helping each other out, like you guys said, yeah. like, you know, I don't, I expect, um, I don't expect anyone to ever, like, you know, um, sort of promote me sort of thing, but it's nice if someone you've worked with will still take the time to like your stuff after they've worked with you, rather than, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just about having that relationship there. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, so my channel is Who Dare Rolls. Um, I don't think we're probably at the Monty Python. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yeah, um, we don't we don't tend to cater for the for the all all populace. We swear. We kind of treat people like adults. But, you know, Dice Tower does blanket. It does the Disney fight thing at four games. We we're, we're the popular West Craven version. <laughs> um, but yeah. <laughs> So we just do stuff. We just—I mean, it's sporadic. Uh, there's lots of things. We do podcasts, like a video. Uh, there's blog. I'm like, writing about stuff. We do all sorts of stuff. Just bits and pieces. I think the the two key things really is number one, the worst thing that happened to a publisher or designer is no one speak about your product. Just that silence. Uh, that's that speaks volumes, <laughs> in my opinion. In anything else, no amount of bad reviews or anything, the terrible reviews or whatever, it's silence, that's the killer. If no one's talking about your product, no one's talking about your game, then it's dead. Um, and that's, that's much more powerful than any, any great review or even terrible review, just you being ignored. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've given bad reviews. I usually, if there's something I don't like, um, I'll speak to the designer. I, I like to have that to and fro between there. And I, I have built relationships with designers, Andrew, from your early days, you come there. And, and, and I, I've always kind of tried to champion local talent, if I'm being honest, because, you know, Basil, Rado, uh, all those guys, they've got the FFGs of the world tied up. You know, I'm not going to compete with them. It's a noise. I can't do that. So I, I, I almost like to go the independent review route now. I look at the, the smaller publishers, the smaller designers, because they're more interesting and they're local talent. So I've got more access to them. Um, so I really enjoy that. Uh, yeah, and also, if you're doing a Kickstarter, don't send me the email the day before it leaves. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to tell you the problem. Time is definitely yeah. the important thing that a lot of people forget about. And I, I guess it depends on the content that you're producing. But I tend to like at least four weeks to produce a video. That's yeah, giving me a week to do playtesting, a week to kind of do scripting and talking back and forth with the publisher. And then a week to do filming, a week to do it. 
and lots yeah. kind of fitting that around all the other videos going on and stuff. That's about it. Because a video for me, a review, will take about 15 hours of work totally. So yeah, it's a bit of a format. We've I mean, written I tend to write and go away and come back and write and go away and come back until I'm happy. I like to make it a story rather than just a, a, a quick note yeah, somebody reading The Guardian or a film of you. I don't want to do that. I want it to have personality and character to it. That's what my thing is. I don't want it just to be a you know, Two a dozen people turn out those reviews. I've read this and this and this and it's just a regurgitation of your book and there's an opinion. Well, brilliant, but... That person for me isn't doesn't do it for me, so I I like to give it some story or character or something else. I want to entertain you rather than to just give you that review in my opinion. Mm. Uh, yeah, it does take time. I mean, and I agree. I I like to do the same thing. It does take time, and if people want to do something. I mean, yeah, it takes time. I mean, you know, if something really catches my attention or a game, I'm yeah. really I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. Then I champion it and I do everything I can. Um, and it, it's what it is. I mean, you, you'll sometimes get feedback from that, you'll sometimes get shared. It is the way of the beast. I mean, you just do what you do, you keep plugging on is the main thing, I would say. Just stay there, outstay the course, everyone else drops dead around you, you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, you've got a question? Yeah, yeah, well, well just a couple of observations. So, I've been on both sides. Yeah. I, I've been running my blog since 2010, so I'm kind of an old man. But um, one thing I learned, one lesson I learned from the blogging side is just advice to the folks for you guys in terms of uh, one thing I picked up is that um, if, if there's going to be a negative review uh, in quotes, right, I think it's important to make it clear that, uh, that negative in the sense of your own personal taste, yeah. style. Yeah. Uh, when, when, well, when reviewers don't do that, it just winds people up. You know, because it yeah. sounds like it's a definitive, my word is, it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. if, if all judge the dread, I am the law. This game is rubbish. Well, yeah, that yeah. doesn't help. Slaying a game uh, is unhelpful to everybody concerned. Because, uh, I don't know what, basically, what you read is that format that was about, you know, like, actually, it could suit somebody else. So I had to learn that when I was writing my review. Um, on the other side of it is, I think, the, the big lesson, where, and, and, and I know you'll, you'll, you'll feel my pain on this one, is, is getting feedback on your baby. When you design a game, you get it out there. It is really hard. <laughs> and, and one of the things I would always say, if you haven't had a game published yet, you need to really come to grips with that. That's one of the hardest things about being a game designer, is realizing your baby, somebody, somebody's not going to like it. I promise you, there are going to be people out there that's just not going to work for them. Uh, so so it's, it's about realizing it's okay. Because it's because as, as Mike intimated, it basically all all publicity, all publicity is good. Even negative, it still gets other people, oh, let me read that one. And then, oh, actually, that's a game I like. So, so, but it is really, really hard emotionally because you're like, gosh, that's part of my life there. Right? So, so as part of one of the biggest lessons you need to learn is that you need to accept that and just move on. Uh, I think that's a big deal. But if people don't like the game and you've designed it for that particular reason, so it's got to take that mechanic in it, and people don't like to take that game, then that's just like, it okay, just means cool. it's not the game whatever, for them. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever. Yeah, for whatever reason they don't like it. Uh, I mean, I've got people who hate wrestling. Um, <laughs> so they'll slay them together, right? But then I got on the other spectrum, I got, I got wrestling fanatics who love this game. So it's like, you just you know, you need to learn to roll with that as part of it. Uh, but one of the greatest things that I've, I've learned is that it's important to work with the UK media. The American media dominates. And, and the more we can do to work with the UK media, the better. Uh, because we have some talented people here. Uh, and, and there's those who aren't here today. But a uh, great bunch of folks to work with. And, and just you know, all the things I've got to know, even my guy got to know, gee. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's really great because there's, there's great people in the industry in the UK. And this and one of the reasons why we're here today is to, to, to really encourage and build the UK industry. So let's, let's work together. Okay. Uh, just a question about time and schedules. So yes. obviously giving you the guys as much notice as possible for you. To what extent do you have a fixed schedule when, when you've done a review and you want to get it out? Or will you sit on it until a publisher says 
quite like it to come out at this stage during the Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. usually work at those rounds. If, it, if it's a Kickstarter and, I, and I've got time and I can do it, then yeah, I'll say, well, look, do you want this to go out day one? Do you want me to drop this through the campaign? You know, if it's, it's going to help you to point, then I'll bother them fine. Um, usually early days is good to get the word out. So probably early days is when you put it out. Um, yeah, I think one thing is everyone here I'm aware of doesn't have like a specific day that they release their content on or anything. And I know there are some reviewers out there who are like Thursday is the day my review comes out. If that doesn't work for you, well sorry, it's gonna be a Thursday. However, none of us operate that way, so we tend to be quite flexible of sure I'm gonna be free enough to post it on that day, that's fine. Yeah, um I think it's best to agree in advance. I, I mostly always say, like, do you want me to it's a Kickstarter? I say, do you want me to put my video up on the launch day? And then sometimes the um, designer or publisher will say, oh no, maybe mid campaign to kind of, you know, just shut up a bit, but it's getting a bit of a mid campaign to lower. So, yeah. Listen, you had a question. Um, yeah, I guess it's, it's sort of touching on a few things that have been kind of um, brought up already. And you've just spoken a bit about honesty and integrity and about us. So there's, there's, a, there's a specific contract or sometimes an unspoken contract between you and whoever's giving you the game. Um, <clears throat> um, in terms of Kickstarters and sort of crowdfunding projects, um, there's also a sense of responsibility in terms of what you say about this game could have quite a significant impact on the success or failure of that project. That's what you, you, know, you can talk about, that responsibility and how you handle that. So yeah. If someone gives you a game which you think is just bad, and, and you tell it's going to fly, what, what do you say to them? What, what do you do? I mean, hopefully, obviously, we've done the whole in advance of four things taking place, so we've got a bit of a shoot up to it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll send an email. If, if, if I've got mechanical there's mechanism <coughs> problems in that game, or rules problems, or, or something that I, I'm just going, this doesn't, it's broken, or, or whatever, if I think that, then the first thing I'll do is send an email to the designer, and I'm going, look, I, I don't get this. Why is this here? Or this doesn't work. Or, mm. So open that conversation. I might be doing something wrong. That's quite possible. In which case, we can correct that. Um, if I'm right, and that is just that problem, I will often go, well, look, my opinion is this. Uh, I will usually, at that point, go, um, yes, the balls in your park. If you, I, I won't publish it. I won't do it. Then fine. You know, I'm not going to waste any further time with you. If we're not getting if this, this relationship has has died, we're divorced now. Then really, there's no much point in me going further down that road. You know, God go with you, sir. You know, you go and publish again, whatever. And and, and I would <coughs> uh, That's usually the route I go down. I will try and fix those problems and have a relationship. Yeah. And, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. What you I've uh, tended to do once or twice is when I really couldn't get on with the game, like I knew that there wasn't, there was nothing wrong with it, I just really wasn't, I really didn't like it very much. But I was, I'm aware that obviously small publishers starting out, you know, it's not, it's not called cool to trash their reputation when they started, because that's just not a nice thing to say. So I would always pass it on to someone else, I would say to the, just be honest and say that, I'm not really enjoying it too much, it's not for me. Do you mind if I pass it on to someone else? And I'll pass it on to another person I know who might have liked it instead. And that's the kind of good thing now I've got in um, board game exposure group is because there's five of us, there's been a couple of games come up and I've said I know for fact it, it's not going to be for me and I haven't got the people to play with, I haven't got the um, right type of people to play with, but someone else can do it because we've all got different lifestyles and different like board game groups. Or if it's so bad that you decided that no one would do it. <laughs> <laughs> someone's this got to do it. would be the first time I've set by the live on him. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a first refusal before as well, so uh, you kind of write your review, you play your game, you write your review as a kind of first draft you know, before you before I work on it any further and send it to that designer, that publisher and this is ballpark what I'm going to say about your game, right? If you don't want that to go up, then if you don't, if you if I don't like it and you don't want it to go up, then you just don't go up and I, if I don't continue doing any more work on it. Um, if I've been able to present, if I, there's certain aspects of the game that I haven't liked, but I've been able to d present those aspects in a balanced viewpoint, um, they've been happy to go ahead and do that, and they've, they've gone up and they've, they've published it anyway. But that's something I've done previously, I don't know if you've done but yeah, you get the first, 
first refusal. I would say it very much depends on if it is a Kickstarter game, beta published game, and also just kind of the relationship you've had pre existing, what you've actually agreed going into it with the publisher. Was it agreed you'll get veto power on this, etc.? Or is it, you know, they've just sent the game expecting a review? If so, they kind of have to be happy with where it's produced. Absolutely. If it's a pre Kickstarter game, they're sending you the game. Generally, the best practice is to say, look, you're aware that there's this, what I feel is a problem, and have that conversation with them. If they turn around and say, well, you're wrong, <laughs> then that's not the best way to deal with it, and you're probably still going to go ahead with that feedback in the, your review, because they're not listening to you, they're not going to change it, they're, they're not giving you a reason why you are wrong, they're just saying you're wrong. And it's, it's going back to what Mike was saying about that, that people, you know, this is something that is your baby, it's something you've created and you're very sensitive about it. But it's the same way for us creating our content. We, we have that. No one wants to say something bad about your content, you know, because we know what it feels like to get those comments ourselves. So we don't want to be just saying bad things for the sake of saying bad things. But we're not going to go, this is the best game ever, about every game just for the sake of it, because frankly, we'd be doing you a disservice, we'd be doing ourselves a disservice, and we'd be doing the audience a disservice. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we, need, we need some self administration. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to raise uh, Rory's point before he brought it about this kind of veto thing. Um, like, I know that um, people like us, for example, the guy who does um, sort of is this good for visual... The, the um, teardown, the accessibility yeah, teardown. Yes, ex yeah. exactly, that's the word, thank you. Um, so he sends a preview of it so that you can respond to it if you wish to. Um, and. You know, it is a problem sometimes with reviewers, whether it's down to having too many games to review or, you know, review rules being a bit shit, um, it, sometimes rules do get played wrongly. Mm. And obviously when someone says this is a bad game because this isn't addressed in the rulebook, then you say, well, it was addressed right here. Mm. And in a way, you know, having that veto power it not even veto, just kind of that advanced preview, then you could say, hey, this is something that you are doing actually wrongly. Yeah. And so, um, like with your stuff, because it's more, you don't go into that kind of detail really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with your stuff, um, have you considered doing that a bit more? And if not, like obviously you do that anyway, but you three, like, have you considered doing that a bit more, and if not, why not? I mean, it all depends on what's being agreed ahead of time, the service being provided, because at the end of the day, that's going to take extra time, and especially if it is, like, video content, it's not just as simple as go back and change it, it's mm. go spend several hours doing rewrite, re-recording, rewriting the sure. shirt. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it's not like, it's a blog post so that you can just copy yeah. and paste, edit that, nice and easily. It's much easier than yeah, 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 yeah. changing a video. Um, so there is an element of you've got to factor in how much time you have and whether or not it's a drastic and important enough difference to actually make that change. But I think it's important is that you've got that dialogue, if you have that dialogue. I mean, say, Mike, if you had a problem with a rule, if you've got that dialogue with the designer, it is just a phone call or a text message to make sure you've got that clarity before, yeah. you know, before, it, before it continues. And I think that, that dialogue has to work from both sides. Why do you all do this? Um, I actually just started doing it literally for fun because I liked playing games when I first discovered playing board games and um, was a new modern thing that we're doing, which I didn't realise before. Um, I just really I just really enjoyed doing it and um, I was I used to be a photographer, so I like taking the photographs. And so um, then I just kind of wanted to meet more people. So then I kind of went on Instagram and started just meeting other people who were doing it as well. And then I just went from there. And I still kind of just do it really because it's something I enjoy doing. Um, and obviously, as I was, I was talking to you earlier, like, you know, about other things that I'm doing, um, I still have to start my own business and things away from reviewing and um, that sort of thing. But yeah, um, 
I just and I always say to myself if I don't enjoy because obviously when you get things like a negative a negative feedback or like someone dislikes one of the videos it is a bit of crap feeling and you do feel a bit like oh yeah What's wrong with his face? Sorry about that. Yeah, you get bad ladies. But if you enjoy doing it, that's the main thing. I always say that if I don't enjoy it, I won't do it anymore. So yeah, I'm just gonna hang around doing stuff. I love it. I mean it's uh, you know, it was a hub it was a hobby, it's a passion thing for me. I Many moons ago, I worked in the video game industry and I did do a lot of press and writing and stuff during that period of time. And I'd stopped it and then I had families and commitments and children and responsibilities and then I got back at the hobby about five, six years ago. And, uh, and I was like, oh, you know what, actually, uh, I'm enjoying this and started just blogging, just writing little bits and thought, no, and it just grew from there. It was just like this kind of recapturing my lost youth and, and, and being able to just do stuff I knew how to do. <coughs> yeah, I think it's very much the, the reason to keep going is just enjoyment. Because mm -hmm. if we weren't enjoying it, I mean, most reviewers, content creators, it's not their job. They're not doing it to make money. It's literally, it is them wanting to be part of the board game hobby, working with all of you, and just enjoying the process. We all love games. That's why we're here. And we just want to share that love with everyone else and be part of the community. For me, it all started uh, when Peter at ITB hosted the Game Jam back in January. As a kind of budding game designer, I came along to that and had such a good, fun experience meeting up with various other people. Uh, and afterwards, I wanted to give something back to the community. Um, I've always enjoyed writing and I studied writing. Um, so I decided oh, I'm going to write a blog about that. So I started blogging about my process of being a designer. Um, and then I saw that Zatu Games were looking for reviewers. And well, that seems like an interesting thing to do. I've always loved, um, you know, roping people into games. And I love introducing new people, you know, friends and family and workmates into the industry, into the, into the community. And I thought, well, writing about games and sharing my love for them is another way to do that and kind of spread that net a little bit further and that's how it started for me I continue to do it just because it's so much damn fun. Yeah uh, I got into it because um, well I love board games but um, I think I saw what was out there and I just uh, I've got a background in writing for TV and I and I um, I felt that I could offer something different that would still be interesting to people and I was looking for like a new creative outlet myself um, and so I, I thought I'd give it a try. I was seeing the success of Shut Up and Sit Down and the Dice Tower and stuff and wanted to see how it would go. Um, why I've stayed in it is um, <laughs> a big question that I don't have an answer for right now. You're a adoring fan. <laughs> so, Dave, at the back, you had a question for you. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to comment, sort of touching on what you were saying about you know, the sort of working with publishers and making sure that, that everybody's happy. With, with what goes out, I, I, like I, I've seen people talk on, on like like players and people talk on BGG and whatnot, and, and they really like there's a lot of kind of mistrust of, of reviewers and, and they assume that reviewers are being paid by publishers and, and you know they, they, they fucking hate you guys. So I would I would kind of assume that it was always best. To, to say what you think always and, and, and for publishers just to have to accept that and that's like, I'm coming from the perspective of a publisher and designer who, you know, I, I, I was, when I released my game I was ready for people to, to have whatever yeah. opinion they wanted and you have to be ready for that. You know, if, somebody, if somebody's gonna, gonna pole axe it, then that's what they're gonna do. Unfortunately, in my case, it was Tom Vassell that did it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I feel broke. <laughs> I'm not alone, I'm not alone. Yeah. And I think it's a, <laughs> it's a good point, yeah, you've, you've got to have that. You've got to have that integrity. I think I offer, I offer the kind of the first refusal almost as a course of politeness to, if you're going to give me your game uh, to preview ahead of your Kickstarter, I think as a, it's a polite to let you know what I'm going to release before it. When I say you get to almost veto it, 
you can't then go through it with the yellow pen or the red pen and go, you're not allowed to say that, you're not allowed to say that. Um, it's a case of, this is what I'm going to put out there, this is what I'm going to you know, take photos and I'm going to do another re redraft and re-edit of it. Um, that's what I'm going to say. And you can either say yes or you can say no. And as Mike said, if you say no to everybody, you've got no one talking about your game and that's almost worse than having a negative review. A good reviewer, and by that I think I mean a reviewer that takes their time with doing reviews, and I'd like to class myself at least on the cusp of that, uh, is when I don't like something in a game, I'm going to be able to objectify it and say, I do not like steampunk rally because I think it keeps moving the goalposts and and I'm going to be able to tell you why I don't like it. I'm not just going to say the artwork is shit, you know, this mechanic just doesn't work, it falls flat. I'm going to try and justify it um, and that's what I want to put in my reviews and that's what you're going to see and that's what people who are backing your Kickstarter are potentially going to read. It's for them to make I just think like, ultimately re reviewers have to have the interests of the players yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. Our, our, our publishers and because players will pick up on it if you haven't. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, if I have that relationship with pre Kickstarter, I tend to do that. If, yeah. That's why I tend to have that open design thing if it's not published. If it's a published game, in my opinion, then you're a fair game. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, I've written some terrible things about Robson Crusoe. I love Robson Crusoe the game, and, and, I, and, I was, and I also dug into it and really give it some shit. Uh, and Ignace is quoting it, so, <laughs> you know, it, it was honest, it was honest, passionate feelings. I love the game, I hate the game, I hate this, I hate this, I love this. And, uh, and I think if you get that, then everyone can see where you're coming from. Uh, yeah. I think it's just being evil for evil's sake is probably the yeah. and, I mean, yeah, if we were giving tips to YouTubers, I would definitely say you need to do some negative reviews to kind of, like, uh, people are watching with... Uh, like a hawk and there was a recently a thing on reddit about man versus meeple and how they only do positive reviews and then you start to question whether they're getting paid for all of them and they are yeah well i you know they admit they are so i know yeah but not all of their reviews no not all of them anyway regardless the point being that like yeah you you've got a if you want to build an audience and a loyal audience yeah you need to uh you need to show that you can be critical about something, or otherwise you're useless. So, uh, yeah, yeah. and so, from an entertainment point of view as well, like you want to see some fights. Yeah. 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 This is more like comment section flame wars. Like. Yeah. Um, you spoke a lot about doing pre-Kickstarter reviews and uh, reviews of things that have already been published. But what about uh, designers and independents that are building their own sort of community within the community and trying to do things to get that input? that input that they need to better their games and to better their process because they don't have the support that, publishers and so on. That would be playtesting. Yeah, that would be playtesting. <laughs> that would be getting, you know, together with tabletop generation and sorting out, finding playtesters, joining Playtest UK. That's what they're there for. Reviewers are not there to provide a playtesting service. Not so much a playtesting service, but you have a wealth of experience that maybe playtesters and people that don't have that objectivity and don't have that. You, you'll find if you go to things like Playtest UK, they do. Um, yeah. Because um, they go every week. There's, yeah. Yeah. there's yeah. free every week um, in London. Yeah. If you really want someone yeah. to go walk to what is your baby? Oh, yeah. Bring you it host to a retailer. Like, <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. Peter hosts some of the Playtest UK stuff in. Yeah. So yeah. That's and that's cool. with designers and experienced yeah. people who know about yeah. games will give you good feedback. Yeah. There's yeah. plenty yeah. of that. I personally yeah. just wouldn't have the time. That's my reason. Sure. Yeah. Just the industry has a lot of crossover yeah. with all the controls. Yeah. yeah. I think if you're doing it from the other aspect, yeah, sorry, <laughs> is that to, if you're trying to build your brand and build awareness of your game that you're playtesting and designing, you're not looking for um, reviews or feedback necessarily from us. It's a case of kind of getting involved and it's contributing to the contributors and you know, it's building it's up building that relationship. relationship. That way when you've got a game that is ready to be released, if You've been liking and sharing and commenting the hell out of everything I put on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And then you come to me, I, I know who you are, I know your name, I know your face, when you say, this is my game to get to the next week. And again, as we said at the beginning, you're going to move closer to the top of the pile because you've been sharing my content, I'm going to start sharing yours. I think if that was the other side of your question, then that's something that could I mean, be done quite naturally. 
getting that critical feedback really that you would expect it's, it's, from us. It's, it's you, more, you should be able to get the same okay. from places. It's more building on it than before. Good question. Building up that relationship. All it comes down to doing is speaking to reviewers, having a relationship with them, both in person but also on social media. You know, you see us post. You, you do a comment on there, we get to know about it. You know, we then start following what you're doing, you'll know, what and we're doing, and we just usually build up the relationship. I'm out there. No, no, no. You might be going over here, man. It's not my stuff now. Oh, it's oh, <laughs> Okay. So, this is a question for the YouTubers. Um, I've been on a YouTube channel for the last nine months. It's released a video every day since July 2016. I wanted to know, like, how do you guys gauge what works and what doesn't work? I mean, does the videos every day work? I mean, from a kind of content creation, you know, I how do you gauge videos it? videos every day people did not want. They don't have the time to watch a video every day. Okay. That's one thing I found personally. And I had feedback from people who were watching saying they don't want me releasing a video every day. Even if I release that number of videos, they'd rather it was released in a bulk mm -hmm. and then they'll watch them when they want to watch them. They don't want a notification every day that you've got another video going on. Okay. Having said that, YouTube does want you doing that, and you will perform better on their search results if you are. Yeah. So it's very much a double-edged sword. If you, if you don't have the sort of feedback coming, we, we have had people say, like, oh, I'm just waiting one week and I watch them all in one go anyway. Um, how, if you don't have the comments, though, how do you, like, do you look at the views, do you look at the subscribers, like, what's yeah, the I, best way? I just I, I don't really so much anymore, because it kind of does too much, but um, I used to look at my analytics a lot and um, also sort of looking at subscribers. And I found that at times when I didn't post anything for a few weeks, I would lose subscribers because I couldn't. I just didn't get subscribers really. by not posting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's true. Of it, I think that's true of all YouTube channels. Um, you, you only YouTube only pushes you to so many of your subscribers, and most subscribers subscribe one day and then they don't go back on YouTube for a year. And so you're always going to get a small percentage of subscribers. My take on your question is um, that you've got to kind of work out how you're differing to what's out there. You've, you've got to reach the people that. Um, well, you're either trying to reach the people that are already catered for by the Dice Tower and the, the existing ones and give them something different, or you're trying to reach the people, I guess, that don't feel catered by those people. Um, and the, the biggest channels, they make a living from it, so they're doing it every day. So they have the potential to release videos every day, and they're potentially better videos than yours because they can afford better cameras and, and they've got staff working for them, all this stuff. So you've got to do something. You can't be. You can't release more videos than them. You can't release necessarily more better quality. Or certainly, you can't review as many games as them. So you have to do something different. You have to offer something different. Um, and that's where I found uh, my channel succeed the most because, like, I've done a couple of comedy songs. I'm not saying you should all do comedy songs, uh, but uh, you know, no. <laughs> but I did it. Thanks. Uh, I did a couple, you know, and, and th that was something that other people aren't necessarily doing. And it's not just that. I, I've done uh, top tens and, and the fact that I dress up as these characters and people seem to like that um, is something different to what other people are doing. And, and those are my videos that kind of that go, uh, that go big on Reddit where I've, I've had sort of some of my success or they go big on Ballgame Geek or on Facebook. Uh, so I don't think it's... My approach is never to worry about the regularity, although certainly YouTube prefers that. Um, it's about, like, every time I make a video, am I making the best one that I can make, and is it going to stand out? If I review a game that Dice Tower has already reviewed, because I couldn't get there quick enough, because they get their copy, like, three months ahead of me, and then they played it, like, within a few days. I took, like, weeks to play it. I have to do something different or in the way I would perceive to be better, um, and unfortunately that usually means a lot of effort. But I, think, uh, but I think what the question is, what are you looking at 
to say that video was successful, that one yeah, was Well, I mean, I'm looking at views, like, and I'm looking on how it went on Reddit and how many likes it got on Board Game Geek and how many likes it got on YouTube and, yeah, and so they just kind I, I think the answer is there is no clear, no clear answer. Way, really. I mean, yeah. subscribers is the one thing I would say is not a success rating of a video. Subscribers, with yeah. regards to YouTube, is more potentially a success of the channel, but not guaranteed to reflect that. Views is what you're going to judge right. based okay. on. Views and then just general chatter, likes, comments elsewhere. Um, very much so, you know, you can see if you just go, what's your most viewed? Okay, you'll see big differences on some videos and know, right, that's what's popular. For example, top tens. Oh, yeah. I, I think anyone who's done YouTube and done top tens will say they're in their most popular videos. Yeah. Most viewed. People yeah. like top tens. And you can instantly tell that because you see the jump in views on that compared to other things. And a big part of that is people search for that. Okay. And you can tell that by going down into the analytics, looking at where those views were found by. You can like look at, was it based on a search? Was it from an external source and stuff like that? So we, we found that the I mean we don't we, as a rule we don't do top tens because of things, but our, we found that our, our actual <laughs> views of even if we've done a terrible video where we've just been like this game yeah. is shit you know we we've not enjoyed it. it we look bad the camera's all bad just the fact that it's like blood bowl or something big like the massive darkness came out. It just it completely confuses us. Yeah, more. that's always it's gonna help. Like yeah. the game. But then that's another decision, you know, definitely. Yeah. You, it's in your interest to cover more popular games or games that people are going to be searching for, games that other channels haven't covered so that you're the top of the search results. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like a weird thing. You, you learn this algorithm in your head and <laughs> titling is really important. Like if you give it a good title, people, because like you said, views, views come from people clicking it and they could watch it for 10 seconds and then go again. But I suppose if you want to <coughs> retain an audience and build, um, you're not just going for views anymore, you're going for people that are actually going to watch it the whole way through and that's where you get into deciding what, how you've made the video rather than just what the video is about. Yeah, so it's never easy. You've just got to kind of let it roll. It's interactions what I find. When I start people actually kind of interacting with me or actually popping up in chats or getting a tweet or getting an email, that's when I go, oh, that's a success. I mean, it's, I just, it's, you get mad trying to drag it through. I, I think realistically, the thing we'd probably all agree is it doesn't matter what is good, what is liked, it all depends on why you're doing it. If you're doing it because all you care about is getting more views, then you're going to be miserable for starters. <laughs> <laughs> and then you would be looking at that stuff. But otherwise, you do what you enjoy doing, you do what you want to do and like doing, and just hope that that's going to turn out to be a popular video. Amen. So, uh, I know you guys aren't really part of conventional sales and marketing channel, but the reviews are kind of like a sales and marketing channel. Um, but affecting the posters back up, there's a bit of that dichotomy in a lot of the time when people want to view the hotness, and people want to read reviews and watch reviews about the hotness. But the hotness is not available. <laughs> you know, that, that's something that we, we see a lot. I don't tend to chase holders anymore like, at all, in fact, because exactly A, everyone's got covers. B, you know, you know, what's the point of shouting about it? Because everyone's shouting about it. It's the hotness. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't do that. Um, in fact, I do the reverse of that just because. because um, but yeah, got them all. Quite often, I find a new reviewer because it'll be the one video on board game. They'll go on there, and then the you know it's come out Monday. On Friday, there's going guaranteed four or five, it's two or three, a five out of the other. And you know they've not played, played it. They can't have played the Sonic thing. They whacked out. Oh, it's, uh, and it's badly angled and shot, and they don't really give you an opinion. And then you go bring it back. That's the thanks for that. So. I mean, there's definitely an element of playing the new hotness is a way to go. 
Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. If you want to build your channel, want to get more people signing on, want to get a bigger audience, then yes. If you hit those, you know, the, the new Simon game, whatever's going to come out, you pop that on the channel, yes, people will come to it because everyone's talking about it. But if it's all about quickness with the new hotness as well. Because I, I recently did Massive Darkness. I was one of the first people to receive it, and I played it nearly non-stop for an entire weekend. So I was able to get videos out really quickly. But most of the time, if I'm looking at one of the new hotness games, the Dice Tower actually covered it three months ago because, as John was saying, they get sent it by the publisher before it's released to the general public. <laughs> so a lot of the time it's not actually that beneficial, but the thing is we're going to review the games we're interested in playing at the time. That, that's what it comes down to, to for me. And a big part of that at the moment is I'm making a push to try and play more of the 2017 releases that people have said are going to be big, you know, best games of the year because I want to do what I did last year is my, my top 10 games of the year. I had so many people say, what about this game? What about this game? What about this game? It's like, not played it, not played it, not played it. So currently I'm making a push to play those, which means I'm then reviewing them. And that's meaning I'm doing less of the Kickstarter stuff, unfortunately. But it doesn't mean I'm not in also interested in doing that Kickstarter stuff. And yeah, there, there's very much a balance of to do it Usually, what I'm playing at the top, what my group's playing, yeah. what I'm playing. If I've got games in the shelf and play that where it comes up, start playing it, well, yeah, and play it a few more times. That usually will dictate what I review rather yeah. than that's new. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, so basically, I think what it comes down to, because you were asking about from a sales and marketing point of view, it tends not to be, a, we don't tend to worry ourselves with that, honestly, when we're doing reviews, you are, that's what you it comes down to. You are creating your own sales marketing tool. And it's a shame that the sales marketing tool that you are it's creating is not half your sales marketing tool. You're not aligning purely because, but as far as that goes, and probably, uh, because this mission could be a little bit um, rubbish in this department. So once you say this, that's fantastic, and then we can't buy it. Because yeah. a lot of time on the trading group, you know, people go, oh, you can buy this, 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 and I'll be going on going, okay, well, all those games are out of stock, about things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'd love to be able to sell that, but actually yeah. we haven't had it in six months. Yeah, I mean, I've encountered that, and it's really frustrating because people comment and they're like, well, why are you reviewing a game that we can't buy? Uh, but usually it was because I started playing that game and making the video like weeks or months before and it was in stock uh, and then it's just timing uh, and so yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I know that um, well certainly they tried to show them sit down try to only they would sometimes hold back reviews until a game came back in print so that you know, they, they wouldn't have that problem. Once. There was a podcast about them and they went, they did the whole thing, the script and everything, games out for like another year. Mm -hmm. like right, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they only stick to the UK ones, don't they? So. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question for you. This man here has been desperate yeah. to ask <laughs> <laughs> questions. When we were reviewing games, it was probably coming out on Kickstarter or something. It's a classic board game, so it has dice, it has tokens, it has components. Because of the funding nature, some of those components will have been dropped from the final format, and there's no such on some of them. Which of the things that we have discussed are critical to you? Which are not very good? Like we have one, and which are not good? From a video point of view, art is quite important because it's a visual media. If you've not got that visual hit and impact, it's going to harm both the popularity of the video and your Kickstarter, because people can go look at it and go, it looks shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, otherwise, pretty much anything can go, I would say. Yeah. It's, it's particularly you know, really easy in written form, um, particularly if you've got designed photos, so for me, if, it's a, if it was a print and play file with some dice and some meatballs, I can raid any one of my boxes uh, for those parts and I can play the game with that rule set and I can write a review. I won't be able to comment on the components or the artwork. Yeah. Um, but then I would be expecting 
that in the that no one's going to want to read a wall of text that you're going to need to supply some actual artwork pictures to me that you um, so in written um, you know audio format that's actually in theory really easy to get around and I'm quite willing to work with anything if you need if I need a specialist piece um, then you're probably going to need to provide that specialist piece um, yeah it's quite easy to me yeah, that's what it's the format. It's written, yeah, there's ways around it, audio, there's ways around it, video, you, you kind of screw with it. The problem is, uh, board game production, especially uh, a lot of people going into Kickstarters now, I mean, they've up the game, so you can't get away these days hitting Kickstarter with. Yeah, it's <laughs> you can't really get away with hitting Kickstarter with unfinished product because there's a game about stick figures. Yeah, you wish. A lot of funders yeah. go on Kickstarter and they will, they will look at your page for probably about seconds, 10 to 20 seconds, and they will make instant snap decisions on that. And if they don't look it, isn't pretty, isn't shiny, I guarantee 90% of them will click off show. But you can't Kickstarter say we need the money for art. Yeah, it doesn't work. No, no, I don't think it does work because there's that's so that's many people are now bringing polished, tinnish things onto Kickstarter. I mean, I'm happy to do yeah, something, I have done with you. For, yeah. for games, because it's it mechanically and rules are yeah. solid, and then you can play the game and understand what it's doing, and then it, if it's just polished and top, then yeah, great, I mean, you can still give a review of that. Uh, I think that's the key thing. It's possible to give a review, but it's how well that review is then being received varies depending on the media. But that's because, as reviewers, we're able to look at it objectively and go, yeah, this is just a piece of paper, that doesn't matter, it doesn't affect how the game actually plays. Probably is your joke public. Okay. Very good, I think that's probably a wrap to that.